Uh, good afternoon. I'm Kim Popovitz, uh, uh, President and CEO of Genomic Health. And just uh, for those that may not be familiar with our company, um, we're a personalized medicine company focused on molecular diagnostics and cancer. So a lot of the conversation that we've had uh, over the day today is certainly applicable to the work that we're doing. Um, we have a test uh, that specifically looks at early stage breast cancer and informs women whether or not their cancer is likely to respond to chemotherapy. So using a genomic approach uh, with uh, 21 uh, select genes. So we have a, a great panel here today. I, we won't go through introductions because we would like to get right to it. Um, we are, uh, I don't think there's any debate anymore. We're in the era of the $1,000 genome, if not less. Um, big question, though, is have we really turned this into value, and how are we using it today in clinical practice? And, and perhaps what are some of the standards we need to set around using the technology um, in clinical practice? So we'll ask um, Howard to start with maybe some examples that uh, you've been using at your center, Howard, and, and some patient. Let me start off with, um, for the last decade, I've heard over and over again, um, it's too expensive. You're not going to be able to use this clinically. No one's going to order it, and no one's going to pay for it. So here's a case from 2009, Nick Volker. If you want to read about this, it's a one in a billion. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning article by these two. It's very simple. Uh, 2009, Nick was dying from some type of inflammatory to bowel disease. You can see him here. Uh, he's now eight years old. And what happened in that transition was that we read his genes using DNA sequencing, found a new variation in a single gene uh, that we could then treat. Um, the next case is Andrew, where We've been working on this for quite some time, and we haven't been as, as uh, lucky on this one or as successful on this one. Uh, we've read his genome multiple times. We still haven't found it, and this was actually uh, chronicled by Nova. And the issue on that, if we could drop Avery's off, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, if, we, if we look at Andrew, some people would say, you know what, um, that just tells you it's not ready for prime time. And by the way, if you did find out what's wrong with him, what are you going to do about it? And so what's actionable? So we can now have a debate about, is it useful? So we've now had over 70 physicians uh, request us to do sequencing uh, for rare diseases. We've taken on 23. Uh, and we've had a subset of these uh, that we've gone out and checked for uh, insurance uh, paid for by insurance companies. Uh, so it's doable. So we can talk about cost. We can talk about value. But I'd like to focus on value. And if we go, could go to the last picture, please. This is Avery. Avery was a typical case that comes into a clinic. Uh, she had um, some failure to thrive at the beginning. And when that happened, of course, the clinical team got involved, the parents got involved, um, but there wasn't a diagnosis. There was no clinical symptoms that anybody could figure it out, multiple gene tests. Long story short, they finally found out what it was. If she had been sequenced at birth, she could have been treated. She'll have neurological damage for the rest of her life. And I'd just like you to stop for a moment and ask, the technology's here, the data's valuable, and it has utility. When do we deploy it? Because it's the value of the genome, not the cost for medicine. Thank you, Howard. Well, that's a nice segue uh, to you, Jonathan. You're, you're making these machines. Uh, how do you see this playing out? Is everybody going to own one? Is everybody going to have their sequence, and when? Well, first, I'm gratified to, to see these children's life uh, change in a positive way because of sequencing. I got into uh, sequencing when my own son was born. He was rushed to the newborn intensive care unit, not breathing. And at the time, it cost $3 billion and took up to 10 years to decode a genome. And I wanted to know why my son Noah wasn't breathing. And there was no such technologies. And myself and people like George uh, developed these technologies and brought it to market. And uh, my case started in 1999, and George about the same time. So it's quite gratifying to see in this 10-year period go from uh, an urgent need uh, to a solution. In, in terms of the distribution of the technology, uh, I do see it being distributed much like modern electronics. One, because DNA sequencing machines can now be built in the exact same factories that make the parts in your cell phones. And because of that, they can, be now, they can be made cheap, and they can be made portable, and they can be distributed. So I see both the distributed model, so if it's a community hospital, and you need an answer within hours, uh, in the case of certain metabolic diseases, not days, you can't uh, FedEx it somewhere and get it back. If it's a rur rural community hospital, where, where a lot of medicine is practiced, I do see sequencing there. But there will also be centers of excellence. 
And as, as George has been showing on the uh, information side, while sequencing will be distributed, you'll be able to walk into your doctor's office. Right now, if you walk into any major medical center, you, you can be sequenced. There has to be an aggregation of the information so we can understand that sequence. And in the same way that the Amazon cloud aggregates uh, my movies and my books, we'll see a centralized aggregation uh, of data and we'll see large correlations with medical records and other records. So distributed sequencing, but uh, a, a central storage of knowledge to, to make sure we can annotate that sequence and give actionable advice to people. So George, how come everybody's not sequenced today? Well, that's a really excellent question. Uh, it doesn't just apply to newborns. They definitely, uh, newborns get analyzed for a few genes, uh, but parents that are preconception or maybe even before you've decided who your partner is going to be, um, why aren't they getting sequenced uh, massively? Um, why isn't everybody in this room? So how many, just a show of hands, how many people in this room have absolutely no insurance whatsoever? Okay, a few. Um, the same thing for g genomes. How many people here have no genome information on themselves whatsoever? A lot more, okay? It's very, I think it's a very analogous situation. You may get to the end of your life and your house didn't burn down and nobody tripped on your stairs, so you never needed the insurance. Does that mean you shouldn't have gotten it? Or you can go to a physician's office and they put a stethoscope on your chest and then you don't learn anything new. But does that mean you should never touch a stethoscope? Uh, it's now cost effective. It's dirt cheap. Anybody in this room could have their genome. It's interpretable for some things, not for everything. Are you going to not take it because it doesn't do everything? How is it different from a stethoscope? What do you see the barriers being today? Well, I think the major barrier probably, and the, the best excuse is, it's changed so rapidly that none of us really realize how sophisticated it is. It's like, you know, it's changed by a million fold, as Jonathan pointed out, in six or seven or eight years. No other technology has ever done that. And so it, we're all perfectly pardonable that we didn't happen to notice uh, that it's now affordable. Uh, it's kind of like the internet in 1993. There were essentially zero websites at the beginning of the year, and there were millions by the end of the year. Um, and so you might be excused for not having started your own Amazon.com. <laughs> There's also some uh, genetic exceptionalism, right? There seems to be a different bar that we're jumping over. So this is an analytical test just like anything else. I mean, it, it has errors, it has specificity, it has sensitivity. But somehow we look at this as it's, it's really different. No, this is a lab value in the context of how we practice medicine, which is the clinical phenotypes and so forth. And so I think a lot of it is fear. A lot of it is, is that it's come so fast. And then I think a lot of it is, is that we've come up with a lot of reasons why not to do it. <clears throat> but no one will tell you that scientifically we shouldn't do it. No one will tell you that it's not valuable. But we have these debates about when. And, and, and I, think, I think we have to stop the debates. There's people that need this. Well, those are some great examples of uh, real practice in real life, and I've always said personalized medicine is uh, when disease gets personal is when it happens to you or a loved one, so gr a great reason to, to move forward as you have. So, Steve, you are actually using a lot of this in your practice uh, today uh, with the hospitals in your, in your group. Why don't you share some of the examples that you did with us earlier? Well, we're working hard to get ready to use it effectively, and I guess the, to kind of paint the picture of the opportunity in oncology, um, it's just completely transformational and enormously powerful from a human and from an economic um, and from a social point of view, and it'll transcend everything that we do. And basically today, the state of the art in cancer diagnostics is to uh, pin the diagnosis to where the tumor first appeared, and so you become a breast cancer patient or a lung cancer patient or whatever, and that defines a lot in your therapy, including matching you with large population, uh, double-blinded studies that have gotten the greatest tumor response for people whose uh, cancer first presented itself in that site. And then the whole industry will allow you to have that therapy and will pay for it, even though if you get underneath it, uh, the tumor response may have been for 30% of the population. So as an industry, we'll pay for 100% of the people to get the care when 30% may not. And again, based on the assumption that the defining characteristic is where the cancer first appeared. 
And the potential for this is to be able to get down to a genomic and cellular level. And as we're able to do this, um, we're, seeing, um, we're seeing cases where uh, leukemia patients express uh, genetic abnormality that's off the chart, but not typically associated with leukemia. And so they'll have gone through the first line of therapy for leukemia patients and failed, absorbed the cost and all the negative personal experience that goes with it, second line, and then you map the genome and you find, oh, oh my gosh, it associates with another type of, uh, of cancer, and that therapy turns out to be effective. So what we're trying to do, um, A, is we're ready to start offering genome sequencing to all of our patients. Um, number two, we've got four different studies basically to summarize, one working at the most complex end where we're looking at all the genomic data and trying to map from that enormous amount of data to, to how it uh, matches with uh, cancer and how it matches with therapy. And we're starting at the other end with uh, right now 200 different uh, chemotherapies and trying to map back to the genomic abnormalities that seem to affect that and then there are a couple in the middle.